exploring our moon, planets, asteroids, and the unknowns of the universe. Here at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, we are combining the strengths of science, engineering, and education to set the stage for a new era of exploration of our Earth, our universe, and of the future. All right, well, hello everybody. My name is uh, Minnie Wadwa and I'm director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration here at ASU. And I wanna welcome each and every one of you to our annual Earth and Space Exploration Day. We're thrilled to have you join us today, even though you know I know we can't hold this event in person this year, we're still super excited to be able to share uh, with you the incredible research and discoveries that are happening in our school. And that'll be presented by our students and our faculty. Uh, this is our first time ever holding our Earth and Space Exploration Day virtually, but our school is actually, um, and actually our predecessor departments before this have been holding this annual uh, public open house event for close to four decades at this point. Um, the history of this event actually dates back to 1982, when it was founded by planetary geologist and longtime faculty member Ronald Greeley. Um, at the time, Professor Greeley uh, had just recently arrived at ASU and he established the Space Photography Lab here uh, in the Department of Geology. Um, and it's now called the Ronald Greeley Center for Planetary Studies in our School of Earth and Space Exploration. Um, as part of an agreement with, uh, with NASA, um, Ron had actually initiated this annual open house to engage the public and to present the results from uh, NASA's planetary spacecraft missions. And over the years, this event has grown into what we call Earth and Space Exploration Day. And it now showcases the broad range of research in all areas of Earth and Space Exploration in our school. So we hope you enjoy the mix of presentations and demonstrations and videos that you'll be seeing today. And we look forward to welcoming you, of course, back on campus when it's uh, safe to do so. But in the meantime, please enjoy today's virtual event. Um, to begin, I'm very pleased to introduce to you our keynote speaker, uh, Associate Director of Community Outreach uh, and Astrophysicist, Dr. Patrick Young. And in his opening presentation, Patrick will be uh, taking you on a tour of the unique and wonderful multidisciplinary work that we do as part of our school. So welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so very much for coming to Earth and Space Exploration Day. Um, now, normally, you would be able to come into our building ISTB4 and see around you examples of all of the wonderful things we're doing at once. But because of the format today is going to be a much more linear thing. So I am going to start out by just talking a little bit about what makes CC unique. And we are not structured like most departments that study the fields that we do. We have astrophysicists, geoscientists, planetary scientists, engineers, and educators, all in the same building and same school. Now, if you've ever spent time around academics, you will hear the terms multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary, and so on, thrown around willy-nilly. And the basic idea there is letting people with different expertise come together to solve problems that they wouldn't by hiding out in their ordinary disciplines. And here in CC, we've taken that seriously and brought all of these people together so we can not only solve these challenging problems, but by talking to each other daily, we come up with new questions that I find it hard to imagine researchers in other kinds of schools ever even thinking of. I know that has been my experience here for the 13 years that I've been here. And I wish I could do more than just scrape the very surface of all of the unique things that we're doing here. But 
since I only have a few minutes, I'm going to just give you a couple examples that I'm involved with so I can speak on them knowledgeably and answer your questions. A lot of our interdisciplinary work is focused around the question of astrobiology, searching for life in the universe. And this is a question that bridges scales from microbes and bacteria to stars and planetary systems. So you need a great many different perspectives on this question. And the focus of our astrobiology research here is in the NASA Nexus for Exoplanet Systems Science programs, Exoplanetary Ecosystems and Create Planets. And our goal here is nothing less than to start with the chemical composition of stars and use that to model the process of planet formation. Check our models with data from meteorites that tell us about the formation of our own solar system. Figure out how those planets evolve over time. Figure out how gases are exchanged between the atmosphere and the interior. And this requires everything from experiments to computational simulations, observational, theoretical, experimental, and field work. And the goal here is to be able to look at a stellar system that's going to be observed with the next generation of large space telescopes to find evidence of life and tell those mission planners whether those planets are going to be the kind that we can actually make a definitive determination of. Look at that planet, see, for example, oxygen in the atmosphere and say, that is a project of product of biology, or that is a product of geological processes. And this is a very important thing if you don't want to be deeply embarrassed on television and social media for decades to come. And as part of this project, I have worked with experimental mineral physicists and biogeochemists, and I myself am a theoretical astrophysicist. And another part of this project is a mission that I'm proposing in December. And this will be the first CubeSat space mission dedicated to astrobiology. And one of my principal co-investigators from the very beginning of the project is a biogeochemist here in CC, Hilary Hartnett. And the idea here is to use the expertise of our geoscience colleagues to figure out elements that are necessary to astrobiology. And we're going to measure in particular phosphorus and potassium in stars to extrapolate to their abundance in planets. And these are elements that affect the interior and atmospheric evolution of planets and phosphorus affects how life can actually make a living on a planet because it's vitally necessary, but very rare. But these are difficult to measure from the ground, so this mission will be able to increase the number of stars with these quantities measured by at least a factor of 10, hopefully a factor of 20, and make a map of where in the galaxy planets with these kinds of good conditions exist. And then finally, taking it a step outside of CC, imagine taking a class taught by a theoretical astrophysicist and a theater professor. Here in CC, many of the, the faculty collaborate with people outside of our school and in fact with even artists. And in this course, we bring together students of all backgrounds to study astrobiology by developing their own questions and looking at the current cutting edge research and at the same time making creative projects that are inspired by what they've learned and communicate the science. And all the students do both parts 
working together. So we have a wonderful communication between the artists and the scientists and appreciation for both disciplines. And our scientists learn about the creative process, which is essential to research. And our artist students get new perspectives on what they're doing, get the research skills you need to function in the flood of information, both true and not coming out of the internet and discovering new creative avenues. So these are just a tiny fraction of the kinds of things that we are doing in CC. And I hope that this manages to whet your appetite for the rest of what you'll see today. And I am happy to take questions. And I don't actually see, uh, there's the Q&A panel. If you guys have right. any questions for Dr. Young, go ahead and type them in the Q&A now and we'll go ahead and answer those. Ah, uh, yes, nice C1. Uh, the question is, is CC open to undergraduates and graduates? Yes, we have degree programs in geosciences, exploration systems design, astrophysics, earth and environmental sciences, and astrobiology. And the CubeSat, uh, we are proposing to NASA in December. So if that goes well, it would probably be in about five years. What's my biggest fantasy in this field? Oh, goodness. Um, adequate funding. How do art and astrobiology change each other's thought process? I think a lot of it is in the approach to how we tackle the questions that we're trying to answer. So I, if you are looking at trying to create something that communicates an aesthetic or an idea, approaching it from a sort of systematic information driven way like science gives you inroads into the creative process that you might not have just going by your own intuition and inclination. Similarly, scientists who are trying to come up with a new question to answer or a new way to approach the question, it benefits them to see new ways of being creative and just connecting with things in different ways is great in general terms because artists don't feel excluded by science and scientists don't feel like that's something for other people who can do it well. And we have some incredibly talented uh, scientists, artists, and the artists research very competently by the end of the course. Uh, do you believe over time, including more and more people from different career backgrounds would benefit space exploration? Yes, something that we're dedicated to here in CC is making sure that people of all different backgrounds have the opportunity and the support to make contributions to what we study. Do we have an under? Do we have a graduate certificate online program? I believe the only certificate we offer at this point is water resources, but we are working on more. What types of careers do graduates eventually gravitate to? 
oh, those are all over the place. Um, obviously, research careers, both in academia and in government labs and space centers and so on, um, but also various things in industry, um, teaching, science journalism and communication, uh, The nice thing is it prepares you for a lot of different fields because you become experts in problem solving and pick up a lot of technical skills. Um, are there any research endeavors going on between CC and other engineering departments on ASU like for graduate students? Uh, yes, there are a lot of cross unit collaborations in that we're involved in between ourselves and various Fulton schools and also other schools in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And frequently our exploration systems design graduate students also get a master's in one of the Fulton schools. And we are developing uh, new four plus one master's programs uh, in cooperation with them. Let's see, what challenges are there between artists and scientists with communication? Some of it comes down to the current environment of hostility towards expertise, and that goes both ways. Because of politics, you tend to see it with respect to the science, but um, some people in the technical fields kind of feel that way towards art. It's a feeling that, oh, that's not for me, and I'm going to sort of insulate myself against that feeling by not respecting it as much. But once you actually put people together who are doing those, they love working together. Um, is it open to non-US citizens? I assume by that you actually mean CC, and yes, it is. Um, would we collaborate with others to create the art, or do we create the art ourselves? Um, in that course, you would do both. Uh, we generally have people do small creative projects, and you don't have to be talented for that. We just want to spur you to be creative. And you also would do a big, large scale semester long project with a group of your peers of both uh, disciplines. Uh, let's see, I think this class is a really awesome idea to combine two things that people often make separate. I was wondering what an example of technology software that will be used to communicate ideas. Uh, yes, so we will probably have a Zoom platform for general collaboration. Uh, we have done this class once before and it was interrupted midstream by COVID. And uh, we were building a website to do virtual um, museum tours of it. And in fact, one group was building a virtual museum in, um, I think it was uh, Unity. And um, people have done a lot of video editing and post-processing for it. Uh, they've used various tools for digital art. So the field is wide open. Let's see, is private funding being pursued in addition to government money? If so, what kinds of private companies? Um, we are associated with the ASU New Space Program, which is a program to bring together uh, industry and academics to advance development of space technology and hardware. So uh, various groups have corporate partnerships uh, that they're working with. In terms of more 
philanthropic sort of donations, that's less straightforward to do. But um, as far as doing space hardware and um, partnering with people like um, Blue Origin or uh, Blue Planet or things like that, um, that is something that's actively going on. Let's see, how will potassium and phosphorus be measured and what and how will it tell you? So those will be measured with a high resolution infrared spectrograph. And we have a fantastically talented optical designer who did the corrective optics for the Hubble Space Telescope. And he has figured out how to put one of these extremely complicated instruments into something the size of a cereal box. And the amount of potassium will tell you how the heat budget of the interior of a planet evolves over the first billion years, how that drives gases out of the interior to make a, an atmosphere. And phosphorus will tell us how much nutrients are available to terrestrial type life. And if a system is say very poor in phosphorus, life there might not be very productive and that wouldn't be a good place to look with your telescope because even if life exists, it wouldn't be making enough stuff to alter the atmosphere in a measurable way. Um, what can you do with an undergraduate degree in astrobiology? What are potential, potential graduate programs? So that one is, um, pretty wide open if you want to go into research fields because astrobiology covers everything from microbiology to various geosciences to uh, astrophysics, exoplanets, and so on. So you could head for a geosciences department, a astrophysics department, um, there are astrobiology grad programs. Um, and then if you were moving outside of the field, uh, it prepares you for general technical fields like a geosciences or astrophysics undergrad experience might do. You'll have experience in writing computer code, uh, reasoning, research, mathematics. What is your biggest goal as an astrobiologist? Actually, well, Dr. Young, we're gonna go ahead and have to move to the next section if you wouldn't mind um, continuing on through the Q&A. You guys can keep asking questions in the Q&A and we'll type answers as we can. Um, but if Dr. Young, you wanna introduce maybe our next speaker. Uh, yes, let me stop my sharing. All right, uh, next we will be seeing a presentation from the Center for Isotope Analysis. Uh, Alicia, please go ahead. I thank you, Dr. Young. Um, I believe Alicia was the student docent, but uh, I'm Brendan Chapman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for these virtual tours. Uh, as I said, my name is Brendan Chapman, and I'm a PhD student with the Center for Isotope Analysis. And in the center, we study stars and planets using microscopes. And it's not quite as easy as putting a telescope up to the microscope. We have to rely on which physical samples we can obtain here on Earth. And for stars, those come in the form of stardust grains. And though these grains are incredibly resilient, lasting for billions of years and traveling for billions of mi uh, miles from the supernovae where they uh, were formed, uh, they are also incredibly small. If we look in the image at the bottom left, we can see that these grains are only about seven microns in diameter or one-tenth of the thickness of the human hair. 
so very hard, very small, very hard to study. For planets, that material comes in the form of interplanetary dust particles, which are dust particles which were either left over from or broken off from planets during their formation, and meteorites as well. And while we can see that some meteorites, as in this image in top right, uh, being discovered by an intrepid Antarctic scientist, some of them are quite large, uh, but we find that their individual components are also quite small. We are also fortunate enough to have received some of the material from the asteroid Itakawa, returned uh, by the Japanese Space Agency's Hayabusa spacecraft. Uh, you may have seen the OSIRIS-REx mission in the news in the past few weeks, uh, a mission to touch down on an asteroid, collect and return samples to Earth. Uh, Hayabusa functioned in a similar fashion, and though they had many problems, uh, they were able to retrieve about 1,500 very small particles, which are nonetheless uh, perfect, perfectly suited for analysis by NanoSins, our analytical tool. And in the following video, uh, we'll take a walk down to the laboratory space, and hopefully you can get a better idea of how we do what we do. Welcome to ASU, and thank you for your interest in the Center for Isotope Analysis. Our lab's principal investigator is Dr. Maitri Bose, and I'm Brendan Chapman, a PhD student in the group. If you'll follow me down to the basement of the Physical Sciences Building F-Wing, I can show you a little bit of what we do. Our primary scientific instrument is a nanoscale secondary ion mass spectrometer, the NanoSIMS. We use the NanoSIMS to determine the chemical or isotopic makeup of geologic and extraterrestrial samples. The primary advantage of the NanoSIMS over other analytical tools is its ability to deliver high spatial resolution of in situ measurements even on areas smaller than one micron. If you do come to visit us in person, please have a look at some of the posters outlining previous work done by our lab. Featured are pre-solar grains and precious meteorites, some of the sample limited materials which are perfectly suited to analysis by nanosims. Careful sample preparation is critical for successful analysis with focused ion beam techniques. As we move down the hall, we come to our adjacent lab space with sample preparation, polishing, and mounting equipment in addition to a petrographic microscope and Class 10,000 clean room. Entering our main lab space brings us to the NanoSIMS room. Samples are moved through a series of antechambers on their way to the analysis chamber, achieving higher vacuum in each via various pumps. The primary column bombards the sample with ions, producing secondary ions of the sample. These secondary ions are then directed into the mass spectrometer section of the machine, where the isotopic ratios are measured. These ratios can then be used to quantify important components of the sample, or achieve scientific goals such as radiometric dating. Whether you're a new student or just visiting, we'd like to wish you a heartfelt welcome to ASU. We hope you've found these virtual tours informative and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Okay, and next we'll hear from Dr. Richard Hervig, the director of the SIMS 6F lab. The, his SIMS is very similar to the NanoSIMS. The largest difference is the spatial resolution. Uh, we can measure samples which are slightly small. Hello and welcome to the ASU SIMS lab. It's behind me. I don't know if you can see it through that glass window. We'll take a tour there real quick. But what it's used for, and it'll be easier for me to describe it in this quieter room, is um, analyzing really tiny spots for just about every element in the periodic table and for several isotope ratios of these elements. We study minerals from meteorites. We've examined the solar wind from the Genesis mission. We study synthetic materials, experiments where people try to replicate natural conditions in, deep inside this and other planets. And these are really small samples from piston cylinder experiments, multiple anvil experiments, and diamond anvil cells. Uh, 
we do a lot of work with volcanic materials, minerals and glass from explosive and effusive volcanoes. We've looked at diamonds and the minerals trapped inside them. Uh, we also study minerals in low to high temperature rocks that aren't included in the ones I've mentioned so far. And we also study quite a few photovoltaic cells, light emitting diodes and other semiconductors. And overall, one of our other goals is to develop better ways of doing all those things I just mentioned. Now let's take a tour into the lab. Okay, now we're back. This is a secondary ion mass spectrometer. It's commercially available because the semiconductor business absolutely has to have these things because they dig a hole in the sample very slowly and monitor the chemistry with depth in the sample so that if you have a set of integrated circuits that don't work right, you'd like to find out what layer went wrong. So what we do is we put the sample in an analysis chamber here and bombard it with energetic ions that are generated in one of two different ion sources. Today we're using the dual plasmatron. Ions from the dual plasmatron are accelerated this way, bent by a magnetic field. They go down this column and strike the sample in there at an angle of about 30 degrees to the sample normal. When the ions hit, they knock atoms off the surface of the sample, and those ions are accelerated away from the sample, which is held at a high voltage also. The ions go through an electrostatic analyzer. They get weighed in this magnet here, and an isotopically pure beam comes off this part of the instrument, and we either take a picture of it with our uh, camera here, or else we send it into a counting system. We get a count rate for the trace all. Here you can see the light microscope image of a sample. It's an aluminum plate with a copper screen or grid squished onto it. And when we turn off that camera and let the ions hit it, we see is a chemical map. I'm letting only aluminum ions hit our detector, and I said it's an aluminum plate with copper screen on top. Well, wherever it's bright, there's lots of aluminum. Now, what I'm going to do is decrease the current, because that's not a microbeam. By the way, each one of those squares is about 20 microns across. And if I turn down the current, I can take the spot down to, that's about a three micron spot. Now let me go back. I can also change the field of view on it, just like having objective lenses in an optical microscope. Now if I turn the current down, there. Now I've got a beam that I can hide behind a 10 micron copper wire, almost. But this is something we can't do on the phone. All right, uh, we are funded by the National Science Foundation to do analyses for um, earth science researchers, although we do let engineers in also. And we let students come in. We encourage students to run the instrument by themselves. This is where you would load different sample sizes into the sample mount and then put them in the vacuum chamber. This is an instrument that if you have skills on, you can actually get a job working for consulting firms or semiconductor firms. Thanks for your time. Indeed, thank you, Rick, and thank you guys for your time. I believe there might be a minute or two for questions if anyone has any. Uh, yeah, so someone asked, so how does the elemental composition tell you about the origin of the samples? Um, I'm more, much more familiar with the isotopic makeup of samples and different um, processes, heating, uh, collisions, that sort of thing can cause very distinct isotopic fractionation. And uh, those are very indicative of where an object formed. Um, as far as elemental composition, um, we can tell basically if something was from our solar system? Uh, is it similar to the composition of our sun and planets, or is it not? That would be a primary one for elemental composition. Thank you, good question. Okay, so I think now we're going to move on to our next panel.
Um, the next panel we have is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera Team. They're going to have a small panel about what they're doing here on campus and what they've been doing in their uh, uh, data and science that they've been. So, um, uh, Zara Hodzik, if you can share whatever you have or start your camera and you guys are up, Elrock. Uh, hi, um, <clears throat> I'm uh, Holly Brown. Uh, I will be introducing us today. Um, I am a researcher um, on the LROC team and I started off as a, a student worker. Um, and then now I've been a staff member for about um, uh, the last five years. Um, and then we do have uh, a, the panel of LROCers here with us. Um, and then Zara, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello everybody. My name is Zara Hodzik. I worked at LROC as a student program aide for about three years and then recently um, transitioned to be a full-time worker working as a research analyst assistant. And then also here with us today, uh, Trinity Ravi. Hi everyone, my name is Trinity Ravi and I'm a third year PhD student at LROC. Um, prior to my PhD, I worked as a student worker um, during my undergrad days and also as a full-time staff uh, for a brief period. And then uh, also with us today is uh, Rick Hoppe. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, hello everyone. My name is Rick Hoppe. I'm a web developer for LROC. I work on a lot of the public facing websites as well as internal applications and a lot of the design materials for EPO events such as this and display within our offices. Awesome. Um, so um, LROC is a suite um, of cameras that's run and directed right here at ASU. Uh, and we receive images, we interpret the images, um, and then we make lots of cool science products, um, which uh, you can check out on our website, uh, which we can, I think, enter in the chat. Um, and then um, we're also hoping to choose landing sites. Uh, so we are going to um, share about a three and a half minute video about the uh, history of LROC and our return to the moon. Uh, so if I can get that going. Cool. LRO is the spacecraft that So the NASA and the science community realized, well, we're, we, we've got to get more measurements. If we're going to really do this smart, we need to have holistic knowledge of the geology and geophysics of the moon so we can pick the best places to go. We don't want to just be just randomly landing on the moon. The Goddard State Flight Center was requested to build the lunar orbiter. And then NASA decided that, well, we're going to let the science community pick what instruments we told NASA why this was critical for a human return to the moon, and they said, okay, build it. Eventually, six other science instruments were on LRO. The original mission was only supposed to last for three years, and now we're in our tenth year, and we're still returning incredibly useful sciences. LROC is actually, it sounds like one camera, but it's actually three cameras. Two identical narrow angle, very high resolution. You know, it's actually, we can see the tracks left by the astronauts. We can get a feeling for what high resolution means. And then there's another very small camera. It's about this size. It's called the wide angle camera. Each pixel is uh, about the size of a football field, but it pictures the moon in seven different colors. Two ultraviolet bands and then five uh, visible bands. And from that, we've mapped out uh, mineral abundance and learned a lot about ages of the surfaces of, uh, of the moon. Between those two instruments, the, we we're really trying to determine the best place to land. And once we find the best place to land in a big picture sense, then we can use the incredible ultra high resolution of the narrow camera to actually pick the exact place to land 
based on its proximity to scientifically interesting rock units or you know maybe something that could be used as an ore. And that was really the goal. Where can we go to do science and also look for ore bodies? My role is you know this much of that. And you have these dedicated people who come to work every day. They make sure that the camera's working correctly, that the commands are right, that we get the images that we need. And also the same can be said for the operations team at Goddard Space Flight Center who actually operate the spacecraft. And you know, you don't want to lose sight that it's because of these people that we continue to make these scientific discoveries. And now it looks like we're actually going back to our original purpose of helping find the best places to land humans on the moon. Uh, so now I think we have a few minutes to ask, uh, answer uh, any questions uh, that anyone uh, has. Uh, a question is one pixel. If one pixel is the size of a football field, what is the resolution of the images? Um, so Alrock is, um, uh, goes from about a 50 kilometer uh, altitude uh, orbit to a 200 kilometer uh, altitude. So that kind of changes with the pixel scale. So at a 50 kilometer um, altitude, we have a resolution or pixel scale um, of about half a meter and then at a 200, kilometer orbit, um, the pixel scale is uh, two meters. So that's um, what we can see on the surface. All right, a big thank you to the LROC team. Um, our next presenters uh, are the Cell and Devil Rocketry. Uh, and let's have you take the virtual center stage, shall we? Let's go right in. Hey guys. Hope you can hear me. Uh, I am uh, Nitesh Chinoju. Uh, I am the outreach coordinator for Sun Devil Rocketry. And uh, I'm also on the uh, liquids team on avionics. And uh, yeah, we're here to deliver this presentation. Garrett? I'm Garrett. I'm a, a senior in aerospace engineering and I'm the hybrids team lead for, for Sun Devil Rocketry. Cool. So uh, just to get started, we wanted to kind of bring the connection between rocketry and space exploration. and we were delivering a presentation to kind of give that intro uh, in, into rocketry. So I guess to start off, uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know what happened there. All right, yeah, so to start off, we could begin by looking at the basic forces that act upon a rocket. Uh, we got thrust, drag, weight, and lift. Uh, lift is a, a relatively uh, different component when, when it comes to rocketry. Uh, lift is only a component in this case because we have the space shuttle. The space shuttle has wings and uh, therefore it can generate lift. Uh, we'll talk more about thrust and how it's being produced. Uh, atmospheric drag is produced by, again, the air. And uh, we got weight because uh, we live on Earth and we have something called gravity. Uh, so to begin, uh, we did want to start talking about a little bit about thrust. Uh, so we got Newton's third law, which effectively says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So this means if you throw mass out of the end of a nozzle, uh, you'll have the other end uh, move in the opposite direction, right? And if you do this quick enough, uh, you effectively produce thrust and you have a rocket engine. All right, so what makes a rocket fly? <laughs> uh, propulsion systems are, you know, they range from very simple systems to incredibly complex uh, system. So pictured below is the RS-25, which is the liquids engine that powers the space shuttle. Um, and as you can see, it's insane the amount of complexity in the pneumatics and the wiring and the avionics. Uh, the, the rocketry that we do in our club is <laughs> a little simpler than this. Um, but for combustion systems, it really requires three things, and that's fuel, an oxidizing agent, and heat. Um, so in our case, in sun level rocketry and in industry, because chemical propellants are 
uh, commonly used because they're the most powerful, have the most thrust output. There are three different kinds. There's solids, liquids, and hybrids. And this describes the state of the fuel and the oxidizer. So solids, there's solid fuel and solid oxidizer. Liquids, liquid fuel, liquid oxidizer, and, and hybrids is a mix of the two. Next slide, please. So orbital, orbital mechanics and staging. So when you take a rocket to space, there's a reason people call it rocket science. It's complicated, but really it's, you can muddy it down into, into a, a simple you know, model. So you have a launch and then you have during your ascent where you reach max Q and you'll hear if you're watching a space launch, uh, the announcer will say we've hit max Q and this is when uh, the dynamic pressure is the, the highest that the rocket will experience on its trajectory. Um, and then you have Miko, which is main engine cutoff. Uh, and then you, you have staging in some cases, upper stage burn, Seco, second engine cutoff. And then you have uh, orbit, or if you're taking your rocket to farther than Earth, then that's when you will, you know, fire again and then leave Earth orbit. So the relevance of rocketry in, in the scope of human history and, and human future is, is pretty, pretty big. Um, so in terms of scientific missions, uh, these are just a couple examples, but um, research satellites, uh, space stations, these are all launched on rockets. So OSIRIS-REx launched on Atlas V, Psyche, which you, I'm sure you've heard of from, from a lot of ASU uh, talks, uh, launched on SpaceX Falcon Heavy. The JWST will be launched on Ariane 5 next year. The ISS, since it's international, has been launched on tons of different rockets um, around the world. Um, in human space flight terms, we have the Apollo missions, the ISS, uh, return to the moon and even Mars later on, all done on rockets. <laughs> uh, and then technological advancement, the more rocketry is an evolving science. Uh, so the more that we, the more, the more rockets that we launch, the more research that's done, uh, we learn more about uh, reusable stages. So pictured here is SpaceX's, uh, you know, self-landing stages invented, you know, pretty recently. Uh, clean propulsion, we're looking at ways to uh, maintain the same amount of thrust output, but, you know, have less of an effect on the environment. Um, and then computer learning and AI. Uh, I'm not sure if you watched the, the Dragon launch from SpaceX a couple weeks ago, but that was mainly done by a computer. The pilots were only there as like, kind of just to <laughs> watch. <laughs> um, but uh, the more that we learn about rocket, the more that we, it's, it's a multifaceted science. So we're learning more about computer science, uh, environmental science, and et cetera. Um, and then for the future, uh, the more, again, like <laughs> I keep saying this, uh, the more the rockets evolve, the more we can start looking at commercial and private uh, trips to space. If you want to take a vacation to low earth orbit, <laughs> you know, um, asteroid mining, and then of course, space exploration. Cool. So uh, now that we kind of covered the gist of why rocketry is useful to uh, space exploration, we can kind of look at the evolution of the rocket. So if you can take a look at the very top picture uh, where it says Godard, uh, that is actually the very first rocket that was uh, officially built by the US. So this rocket uh, was a liquid propelled rocket and actually only went less than about like 50 feet, uh, but it was more of a technology demonstration. And now as, as we know, Robert Godard uh, is, is kind of considered the founders of uh, modern day rocketry. And now if we move down the scale, uh, we could also see that the scale of rocketry increases. Uh, with, with the scale kind of maxing off with the Saturn V. Uh, and then after that, we kind of moved down to a more smaller scale rockets, but they produce a lot more thrust and are now being reusable. So now at the very uh, bottom of the page, you could see we got the Falcon Heavy, which was uh, consisting of three Falcon 9 boosters and was able to land all three successfully. So I'm not sure if you guys watched that launch, but if you didn't, I highly suggest you do. So a little bit about our club. Um... So we, oh, so I'm rock of course. So our, our kind of mantra is uh, to prepare students to become leaders in the aerospace industry through innovative research projects, career preparation, and, ex and experience. Um, so we have three kind of main uh, focus areas in our club. We have research, which is the main one. Uh, and that's split into three subgroups. We have solid, liquid, and hybrid. Um, and each team has their own research project. And we all, uh, we publish papers, we go to conferences, um, it, we are very uh, deep, deeply uh, rooted in our in our research uh, in our club. Um, secondary, we have onboarding, um, and this is this is another team where we uh, we kind of um, take in new members with no rocketry experience, and we teach them everything they need to know uh, to become 
uh, borderline fluent in rocketry. So it's, it's a very valuable uh, experience for, for incoming members to our club. And then we have outreach uh, in which we go to local elementary schools and we give lessons and demonstrations uh, and we let them fire their own rockets. So, yeah. Cool. So uh, we actually had a very basic uh, presentation plan, but we also wanted to kind of reach out to the community and uh, give them a little project that they could do. Uh, in order Uh, I think Natish might have dropped off, but uh, to pick up, to pick back where you left off, uh, this is a small rocket project that it only takes about 10 minutes and the link has been sent in the chat. Uh, and so household materials, you can just go ahead and build uh, a mini rocket for yourself at home. And uh, you can also scan a QR code right there in the corner. Cool. Thanks, Garrett. I, am <laughs> yeah. I back now? Yeah, you're good. <laughs> cool. Uh, so now uh, we'd like to open it up to Q&A. Uh, if you're interested, you can go ahead and scan the QR code. It'll take you to our website. You could look at uh, some of the other projects we've been doing, but uh, yeah. Okay, so I see some questions. In simple terms, how does SpaceX technology do landing, do the landings of the ro booster rockets? So I don't know if you, you might've heard it be described as uh, dropping a pin off of the Empire State Building and landing on like a, like your hand. It's very, it's very complicated, but essentially, you, after the first stage is, is uh, disconnected, the boosters will fall. And then once they reach a certain altitude, they'll fire their engines again. And then they have stabilizers that slowly kind of make sure that the rocket is right side up. Um, and then they have landing struts to make sure that it doesn't topple. Right, yeah. A, a big part of SpaceX is kind of innovation to landing the rockets is, is their control system. So being able to thrust vector, I'm not sure if you heard that term before, but change the angle of uh, the rocket engine and, and use grid pins to change where the rocket goes. They're able to land in a much more specific location. Okay. Um, awesome, wonderful. Thank you so much, Garrett and Natish. Um, that was the Sun Devil Rocketry Group. So they talked to us about the benefits of rocketry as well as rocketry evolution. Um, so if you have any further questions for them, you can go ahead and drop them in our Q&A and we'll type out answers as much as we can. And anything we don't get to, um, we'll see if we can pass that on later. But thank you so much guys for your time and a wonderful presentation. Um, but we are gonna move on next to talk with Gregory Babick, who's gonna speak to us about the Society of Physics Students. So um, Mr. Babick, whenever you're ready. Hi guys, so we have a video we've prepared. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and uh, you guys can, uh take a look at what we threw together. My name is Greg Babich. I'm the president of ASU's chapter of the Society of Physics Students for the 2020 to 2021 school year. And here's a brief presentation about our club. So uh, even though we're called the Society of Physics Students, we're not just uh, for physics students. And that can be seen here from our officer. So here's our list. I'm uh, Greg, the president. We'll be uh, hearing from uh, Chase, our vice president, in a few minutes during the demonstration. And then our treasurer, Mia, secretary, Sammy, and then general officers, William and Nick, are also here today. And um, we have a, a variety of majors, uh, including uh, I'm studying engineering. Um, Chase, Mia, and Nick also study math. Sammy studies biophysics. Um, so see a wide collection of majors here in our officer group and then also just general members of the club. So what is SPS? So we're a professional development organization that focuses on helping undergraduates advance their careers academically and you know just and um, their careers overall. So helping them get into graduate programs you know, find what field they'd want to study, they'd want to go into industry, what jobs they might be interested in. And we do a variety of things to help them do this, run workshops, bring in uh, professors for research talks, and just general networking between students and faculty members here. So um, there, we're not the only part of SPS. There's also a national organization that has quite a few benefits for undergraduates. So first about us, as I mentioned, we do workshops, networking, uh, outreach and other things. Um, but unfortunately, due to COVID-19, a lot of those have been altered or canceled. 
and normally we do have a lounge or just kind of a study hall slash hangout area for our members but due to COVID-19 we've had to close the lounge. Um, National SPS um, has a lot of opportunities as well. Um, big one is you get membership, free membership with your uh, membership to National SPS, you get to join for free two professional physics organizations, such as the American Physical Society, or APS for short, and this allows you to read a lot of the publications that those uh, organizations uh, have put out. And this is invaluable for seeing how technical writing is done, you know, for applications to graduate school, going to industry, etc. And also the National SPS has scholarship and internship opportunities, which as I mentioned are also very important for going forward in your career. So outreach, so normally we do um, many different outreach events here at ASU, such as this ESE day, um, Night of the Open Door and Homecoming. We'd also go to schools in the Phoenix metro area, go to community colleges, and then just do other general events in the area. And we'd show demos there and just talk to people at the events about physics. But as I said, due to COVID-19, most of those events have been canceled or drastically altered. However, we are working on a way to uh, safely um, still do outreach to the community. And um, generally those demos are similar to what you'll be seeing in a few minutes from our VP Chase. So professional development, as I mentioned, we do some workshops. Um, so some uh, one of the most important skills to being a good physicist you can have is uh, programming. So we do workshops in several languages, listed here, Python, LaTeX, and MATLAB. We also go over some CV slash resume writing, which is very important, whether or not you wanna to go to graduate school or go into industry or whatever career path you may choose, you need to know regardless. Also RU workshops. So RU is a term you may hear thrown around here. RU stands for Research Experience for Undergrads, and they're very prestigious programs funded by the National Science Foundation. And getting into one can give you a big leg up on getting into a good graduate program. We also do a career panel, which generally consists of bringing in uh, professors to do talks about their research, hearing from people in industry, and hearing from people in other related fields to physics, like patent law, engineering, and just you know, anything that relates to uh, physics. And then uh, for uh, just FYI, here's our email, our uh, Instagram handle, Facebook username, Twitter handle, and then here's uh, the location of our lounge on ASU's Tempe campus. And then after our demo, uh, there'll be some a few minutes for you to ask us some questions. So thank you and I hope you enjoy the demo. Hi, my name is Chase Hansen. I'm the vice president of SPS for the 2021 year. That's me in the plaid shirt in the background. Uh, in light of the recent discovery of room temperature superconductivity at high pressures not too long ago, we're excited to show you some footage of our very own uh, YBCO superconductors. Um, YBCO, that's yttrium, barium, copper, and oxygen compounds. Uh, and these guys are not, uh, in fact, room temperature superconductors. They need to be very cold, uh, as cold as liquid nitrogen. That's what the tank is there for on the left. And that's what those uh, superconductors back there are uh, hanging out in. Um, at room temperature, they're like the ones sitting on the table there. Uh, they're actually kind of boring. Um, they're definitely not as flashy. Uh, at room temperature, they're just semiconductors. So, uh, and what I have there are some very strong magnets. When I introduce the two, not much happens. Uh, but if I take one of these superconductors out of the liquid nitrogen, it should have had enough time to have undergone a phase transition, and we'll see something interesting. It levitates. Uh, even if I pick it up and flip it upside down, it's still locked into place. Uh, I mean, it's it appears like electricity. What does that mean? Well, the electrons in the material move around inside without any resistance. So in the presence of magnetic field, the electrons make, make it invisible uh, to, the mag to the magnets below. Uh, the magnetic field bends around the superconductor and locks it in space. Uh, it, this levitation is actually surprisingly robust. Uh, with circular magnets, I can put a superconductor on there, on the circular magnets there, and give it a spin. Uh, we give our pin superconductor there a degree of freedom. Uh, we can spin it around in place. Uh, again, the only downside is keeping it very cold. The one on the left um, starting to go back into that, that sorry, that semiconducting phase. So we got to put it back in the liquid nitrogen. That's the only uh, downside to these uh, cuprate superconductors. Okay, so what's the thing on the right? That's a bunch of magnets on a track. Uh, one practical application of these superconductors is actually uh, transportation. 
we we have a few trains actually across the world that um, operate on on the physics you're seeing here. They're called maglev trains. Put little little people on the on the superconductors. Uh, this physics, condensed matter physics and superconductors, is a frontier field of research. Uh, new discoveries are being made every year. And uh, funny enough, the day we recorded this footage, a paper came out that morning for the first room temperature superconductor, a carbonaceous sulfur hydride. Um, now, granted that sulfur hydride. Uh, Superconducts had about 2.6 million atmospheres. So instead of a little bit of nickel, liquid nitrogen, we would need a diamond anvil. But uh, still, <laughs> quite, quite, it's quite amazing. And this is a fascinating field of research um, that you could maybe one day take a part in. Take part in, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, have a great day. So. Uh... Thanks for listening, guys, and uh, I guess from now on, we'll take questions for a few minutes. It looks like one of the questions is, can any of the superconductors support a mass or weight greater than the superconductor? I believe the answer to that is as long as the uh, the magnetic force that's acting between the magnets and the superconductor uh, can sustain that mass, then um, it can, yeah. <laughs>